Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 127, From Holmes to Sherlock. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a stronic man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hey, hey, hey! Hey, how the heck are you? Welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees, where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Walder. And can you believe it? The summer is over like, like that, like that. Oh. That's it. What you is know, the weather like in Michigan? Is oh, it chilly? It's, it's chilly here. It's chilly and rainy here too. It does not feel like August whatsoever. But I will tell you, I was just thinking as I, as I snapped my fingers, just like that, what a um, guy. I was astounded just last week to read a tweet of someone whose mind was blown. He said he was 26 years old and he just found out that the sound emitted from snapping your fingers actually comes not from the fingers rubbing together themselves, but from when the finger strikes the palm. Amazing! And the internet nearly lost its mind with realization that that's this, that's how uh, the sound is made uh, from a snap. And I thought, are you kidding me? How could you not know that? I mean, it was just one of these things that I always took for granted. Yes, it's when your finger comes down on your palm. I mean, how I, – I, I just I, – I nearly lost it myself. And, and, and there were examples of people – Saying, yeah, I, I had to try this like five times and, and they're right. That, that is how it's made. Of course they're right. My gosh. <laughs> oh. Well, look, you shouldn't be too critical. I mean, after all, intelligence like this that once, um, seemed common knowledge to people in a particular generation tends to vanish. It tends to disappear. And I believe what really happened here, if you want to look for the root cause, you could probably trace it all the way back to the death of Frank Sinatra, who probably took this with him. (laughs) (laughs) Softly, I will leave you softly, for my heart would break. When he left, along with Jilly. Nobody talks about Jilly anymore. Oh, Jilly, from Jilly's. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The snapping is gone, along with the snap rims. I mean, only a few of us wear hats. And, of course, the sound that my snap rim hat makes, of course, it's almost felt hat day. But the sound that my snap rim hat makes (laughs) comes from, of course, the brim touching my forehead, not from actually the bending of the felt. Everyone knows that. There you go. (laughs) Where? Where am I going? No matter where you go, (laughs) there there you are. are. Well... We are, we are not here to talk about snappy things, although, you know, it, it, it does bring to mind instances in the canon where Holmes uh, talks about something that was so obvious to him and he couldn't believe that, uh, you know, Watson didn't realize it or Watson didn't notice it. A uh, perfect example of that is, uh, you know, how many times have you 
gone up the steps here at 221B Baker Street. And, and, and have you ever counted the stairs? Do you know how many stairs there are? Yes. And this is one of those numbers that we as Sherlockians know, um, you know, 140, right, from 140 varieties of uh, tobacco and, and, and ash. Uh, we know 1895 from it's always 1895. We know 221, as in 221B, but the other number that we know is 17. Yes, because it 17 was those steps. 17 steps up the stairs. Now, do you happen to know how many times the word snap appears in the canon? How many times snap is used in the canon? Yeah, everyone knows this because we all all <laughs> memorize this. And, of course, this is a great test for searching for Mr. Moon. But the answer is 27. <laughs> Really? Yes, everyone knows that. Uh, how did you come up with that? I asked Mr. Moon. Mr. Moon. S- searching for Sherlock, MrMoon.com. You say 27? Yeah, if you put the word snap in, it comes back and says there are 27 total matches. I have 29. Really? Yeah. Well, that's odd. <laughs> oh, you know what? Snapshot appears in there twice. Oh. So that got counted. Yeah, I just put in the word okay. snap and he come the website comes back and says twenty seven. Hmm. Snap. Oh snap. Well you know it's a snap. What's a snap? Ordering books from our friends at Wessex Press. The ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex is looking forward to the 10th of September, when we mark the death of St. Frithistan of Winchester in 933. We celebrate those who enrich our lives, as you will celebrate the treasures found in Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the Newspapers, Volume 3, edited by Matthias Bostrom and Matt Laffey. These restored, newly typeset stories for the last six months of 1893 show Conan Doyle, the celebrated author, lecturing on the novelists of the day. And they report the presumed death of Sherlock Holmes at the Reichenbach Falls. This essential volume for your library is available right now at our wessexpress.com. Friends, it's September. Fly the white clouds like tattered sails of ships, the treetops lash the air with sounding whips. As the seasons shift, reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wessex Press can provide. Choose yours today. Ordering books is easy, but paying for them by sending the goats through the mail is very difficult. <laughs> well, they accept many forms of payment, don't they? They do. Bales of hay. Harvest elements, goats, things like that. Yeah, you know, there's there's never a uh, there's never a lonely goat herd around, and you need one. <laughs> well, well, we are not here to talk about forms of payment, uh, goats, or other ancient and mysterious things. We are here to talk about from Holmes to Sherlock, the new book from Matthias Bostrom, and of course, we are talking about it with. Matthias Bostrom, which makes it even better. Now, Matthias, uh, many of you may know him. He is a well-known figure in the Baker Street Irregulars and around Sherlockian circles around the world. He is a Swedish author and a publisher and, of course, a Sherlock Holmes expert. I'm not sure if many folks are aware of this, but Matthias's publishing and, and authorship actually go beyond Sherlock Holmes. He has actually authored a number of books about Sudoku, crosswords, and uh, other puzzles and games. So uh, his, his, his literary provenance goes well beyond just our little sphere here. But, of course, he's a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, and uh, he's, he's been an active Sherlockian for the majority of his life, for over 30 years, uh, publishing articles and uh, editing books and uh, booklets on the subject. And, of course, the Swedish edition of From Holmes to Sherlock, which it was Fran Holmes to Sherlock, uh, was published in 2013, and it won the nonfiction award from the Swedish Crime Writers Academy and it was shortlisted for the prize for the best Swedish nonfiction book of the year. So now 
we have the English edition of From Holmes to Sherlock by Matthias Bostrom, uh, of course, translated uh, for him uh, by Michael Gallagher, who did a phenomenal job. And let's get right to Matthias and talk all about it. Matthias, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, this this has been a long time coming, hasn't it? Yes, uh, five years now. Uh, I started writing this book in February 2012, and then it was published in Swedish the year after, one year after, and um, now in English. So where where did the idea come from? Uh, Twitter. <laughs> You're kidding. Well, right? I, I, yeah, that's, that's the true. source of all good ideas. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I was um, live tweeting, expert tweeting, uh, during uh, an episode of Sherlock. Okay. Um, I, some some episode during um, uh, the second series. I didn't don't remember which one exactly, but. Um, and uh, I had so many followers um, asking questions um, because, well, I I wrote down all the canonical references in my tweets and so on. But uh, suddenly I got a question from someone who asked me, uh, when will the book be published? No. And I thought, which book? Uh, uh, but before I had a chance to um, answer the, uh, that tweet, I realized, oh, she wonders when... I will write a book about Sherlock Holmes, a non-fiction book. Hmm. Uh, and I started uh, the next day. What? You don't kid Ooh. around, do you? <laughs> no, but I felt that, okay, now is the time. And I have to um, finish it before um, BBC shows the next uh, series of <laughs> Sherlock. So I would like to time it for for that one. And what and what was your original concept? You know, beyond just a Sherlock book. Um, there were two things, uh, and they were connected. I wanted to do it chronological. I wanted to tell the story of the Sherlock Holmes success uh, in a chronological way, and that had never been done before, mm. which is weird because I mean, uh, almost. All uh, sort of general non-fiction books on Sherlock Holmes are divided into subjects. It's, I mean, it's three chapters about Conan Doyle and uh, how he wrote the stories, and then there are uh, summaries of the stories, and then there are uh, chapters on plays, uh, on early movies or radio or pastiche or fandom of, of fans and so on. But uh, if you, what, you, what you never see in these books is uh, the chain of influences. I want to, sh- to show how could this success um, go on and on and on forever. Uh, and if you only look at the separate subjects like a certain play or a certain movie, you, you never understand why was the, the Ronald Howard uh, um, television series be made in uh, 1954. I think it was 1954. Um, uh, you only know that it, it was done at, at that year, but you have to look at the chain of influences to understand um, how this success uh, continued. Did you have any model for that approach? Are there other books that have told this sort of story? Not really. I, um, I, I, I had models for my style. Uh, I mean, it's a narrative nonfiction where I write the whole book in, in sort of scenes. Um, and um, Daniel Stashower's uh, Teller of Tales was such, was a big inspiration for that. Mm. And also Simon Winchester, uh, for example, his book The Professor and the Madman uh, about the uh, how um, the Oxford English Dictionary was made. Um, 
which sounds like it's such a boring subject, <laughs> but if you um, write it like narrative nonfiction, it becomes really exciting. And I wanted to do it that way. But I, I know, I don't think there were any models for, for the chronolo- chronological approach, you know? And, and how long did it take you to arrive at the, at the, the timeline? I mean, uh, because of your long-standing Sherlockian enthusiasm, you had encountered a lot of this information over the years in your reading, but what would, how long did it take you to actually sort of lay out the timeline and then see what additional research you had to do? I mean, I imagine that must have been a huge task. Yes, and I want to uh, to answer the question you didn't ask me first. Uh, namely, um, uh, I didn't um, have uh, sort of. <laughs> sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, we, uh, I asked about sort of the scaffolding. You know, the whole timeline. Of- yes, and uh, I. Uh, Yes, I, I'll get back to what I was thinking about later on. But uh, it took me a year to write uh, the book uh, from from February 2012 to April 2013. And I, I spent the first three or four months just uh, researching, oh, not not really researching, just uh, ordering books from uh, used bookstores and uh, 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 and, uh, and so on, um, uh, to find articles and so on, uh, which could describe uh, all these things. Yes, I, 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 now I remember what you weren't asking. Um, the thing is that uh, I didn't know much uh, before I wrote this book. Uh, uh, I realized that when I started writing, I, I hadn't uh, accumulated much knowledge during the 25 years I had been a Sherlockian. Uh, I couldn't use much of that. I couldn't Ooh. use, no, uh, and I couldn't use m- m- much of my, I had a, a big library of Sherlockian nonfiction books uh, and so on, but there were very little of that library I could use. Uh, because what I wanted to do was write about people. I, want, uh, I wanted to write about Frederick Dor Steele. I wanted to write about H. Greenhill Smith. I wanted to write about Edith Meiser and, and so on. Uh, I wanted to know who they were, not just what they did in Sherlockian activities, but who who were they married to and who, uh, the personal biography, biographical uh, things, which you don't find E in uh, most of the uh, books uh, about Sherlockian history, uh, because I, if I used such things, I could make this into a story that could be read by non-Sherlockians, because I wanted to mix emotions into this uh, uh, non-fiction uh, uh, book. Yeah, and I, you know, it's interesting because I think you've done that very well because each chapter, uh, some quite short, others, uh, much longer, acts as almost a, a, a miniature story, uh, by itself. You know, it, 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 each, each chapter opens with, you know, you bringing us somewhere back in time or at a certain setting and Almost dramatizing, uh, this situation, which, you know, if, if you're looking at a historical work and, and you're going through chronologically like you are, you do need something to just <laughs> break up all the boring facts. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very effective, uh, way of looking at it. Yeah, so I, I've hidden a lot of facts on every page uh, of this book. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm sure there are at least 20 facts on on every page, but you don't always see them uh, because uh, since there are so much emotions and uh, it's a story about men and women um, and they are 
many of them are quite normal persons and I, I just describe the scenes where they meet and where they do things and that way you care more about the people than you care about the facts uh, that are hidden in the text. Well, and, and so with, with all of that, you, there must've been some big surprises for you. No, as you did, as you assembled all of this, what were, what were <laughs> some of the things that surprised you? I'll tell you some of the, one of the things that surprised me, you know, I read, um, uh, around 1925, your description of the thrall in which Conan Doyle was held by his so-called um, spirit advisor, who was delivering detailed messages and opinions about family decisions that he followed slavishly. I had never encountered that in, in all of my readings about Sir Arthur. I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> yes, Phineas. Uh, yeah, but... Um, Surprised. I think I was surprised all the time because there were so many things that I had never heard about, and um, and I uh, also because I did this chronological, I had never seen um, the connection between two things. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, the books uh, published in the late 1920s, early 1930s, the, the, the books, uh, the Sherlockian classics. Um, I had never really understood how they were connected, so I had to search for um, um, articles written about them, uh, mainly auto. Bio biographical uh, texts, m m the authors uh, remembering how it how it was when they uh, uh, wrote these books, and uh, I suddenly could puzzle together uh, um, how uh, they influenced each other and uh, how that was the start of at least the British uh, Sherlockian. Um, world, uh, and that influenced him, uh, Christopher Morley, and so on. So you mentioned that your your own collection wasn't enough to uh, supply you with the material, and, and you, you were able to find... Um, you, you were able to find some sources through used bookstores, and obviously online, uh, and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, and, and, and let me tell you, as someone... Who's connected with you on Facebook? Uh, it is, it was a joy seeing you open the, uh, parcels that arrive via the post, uh, that would contain <laughs> these obscure and wonderful books, uh, that were clearly part of the research. Um, but, but beyond commercially available books, um, because as Bert said, you, you've, you've dug out some things that are not uh, common knowledge. Where, where did you go? How did you get some of this information? Uh, Google, uh, Google Books, uh, really? mainly. <laughs> That's handy. I mean, I, I just searched uh, for every, every person, every name I used in the book. I uh, searched for them uh, on Google Books and uh, other resources on, on the internet, but mainly Google Books. And what I found was um, sometimes quite a lot of books mentioning these persons, but not in a, um, in a Sherlockian way, in a, not connected to their Sherlockian uh, interests. Uh, if, if one person especially is um, Tony Harwood, uh, who has never been known really in the Sherlockian world to be, uh, he, I mean, he was, uh, um, uh, when Dennis Conan Doyle, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's son, when he, uh, Dennis Conan Doyle died, his wife remarried, uh, Anthony Harwood and, uh, uh, the, the wife was Princess, Princess D Nina uh, Divani. Uh, who wasn't the princess, but anyway, um, uh, and she re remarried this uh, Anthony Harwood, and I, when I checked other p 
biographies and other books about Sherlock Holmes, I've only found maybe one or two or three sentences about him. But um, I, when I searched Google Books, I found that he was a very special pers- person <laughs> in many ways. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I chose to include such things to describe him because I also found in uh, in archives uh, that he was so important for the Sherlock Holmes business during the 1970s and probably also in the 1960s as the husband of uh, Nina Devani. So um, we, uh, I found a lot of things just searching for these mm. persons were you were you able to make it to uh, uh, the British Library or Portsmouth to the Conan Doyle collection there at all for original yes, source material? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I I had a quick visit at the um, British Library, and the only thing I checked there uh, was um, their archive of um, um, the Society of Authors. Um, the British Society of Authors, their archive, uh, because they have a lot of correspondence bet- between the Society of Authors and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle uh, and uh, also with uh, Adrian Conan Doyle later on. And I had to check some things uh, and found actually a lot of uh, interesting uh, conversation, uh, correspondence uh, regarding uh, the George Treville uh, films in the 1910s. Mm. Uh, so I've, I've, I actually found n- new facts about these things. Um, and uh, uh, then I directly after that visit, I have been went to uh, Portsmouth and that was um, uh, the the most important thing for my book because uh, what I found there was uh, all of Adrian's, Adrian Conan Doyle's letters to Dennis uh, his brother from the early 1930s to 1955 when uh, Dennis died, and also all, all the business papers of the Baskerville Investments who had the um, copyright in the 1970s and um, a lot of other things. I, I mean, there are thousands of documents yeah. in, in Portsmouth, and um, no one had really uh, looked at them before. Um, uh, there was made one book about uh, um, the Bessie Rathbone movies, and they were uh, that that book was um, what was it called? England's Secret Weapon. Um, is that book Sherlock called? Holmes' and The Secret Weapon? Yeah. No, 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 England's Secret Weapon. I think it's called uh, oh, book. Uh, yeah. that book about okay. the, the yeah. Rathbone films. Um, I might remember <laughs> wrong. Um, but, uh, uh, and that was based on a lot of that correspondence regarding those films, but no one had really seen all the other things, but be, mainly because no one has really been interested in Adrian and Dennis because the Sherlockian world has never liked them and why then study what they have written to each other mm-hmm. well i thought you know i really think it's fascinating and enjoyable in the story because the story you tell about dennis and adrian are basically about two spoiled uh children who become mature as bright young things in the 1920s and their tomboy sister and that uh, and that his sons his second family's sons Conan Doyle's uh, sons were a constant source of uh, sadness or irritation to them about about their behavior so I think it's a fascinating story but the other thing, one of the things I was really struck by too um, you know because we've all read so much now, now I think you're probably being modest about or maybe not about your information in the Sherlockian world but we've all read so much in terms of biographies and histories 
And yet you, you really have a, you've done a wonderful thing in telling, as you say, this great story, but also so many interesting facts. For example, I had never heard and was stunned to find out that in 1914 in Washington, D.C., Vincent Starrett would sit on the corner of the desk of Franklin Roosevelt and they would smoke cigarettes and talk about Sherlock Holmes. I, I, and that's such a charming, charming picture. I'm just delighted that that fact stuck to you in your research. Yes, and I was so happy when I, uh, I, I remember that um, because I, I saw it, it was mentioned somewhere. Uh, it might have been in one of John Lallenberg's uh, BSI history books, um, and then I bought the uh, the Vincent Starrett book where uh, he had uh, written about it. It uh, uh, must have been bo- born in a bookshop, which is, is his uh, autobiographical book, um, and uh, um, there it was. The, the whole scene. I mean, I, I adjusted it somehow, but uh, all the lines are the ones that, uh, Vincent Starrett wrote or remembered himself. Um, so, um, yes, I, I love, I love that scene. And it was also important for another purpose because the whole book, I, I try all the time over and over again, I try to, put is in a context of what was happening at the time. Um, when you, for example, look at uh, the French silent movies of the 1910s, if, if you only look at the movies of the, uh, the quality of the movies and contents or what, whatever, you forget that there was a war going on. <laughs> there was a First World War was going on at the same time as they were made. So uh, what I found at the um, British Library was that um, when uh, the Society of Authors were trying to contact um, the film company, they they couldn't reach them because all the manager managers were out in war. And I, I, um, that scene with Vincent Starrett and um, Roosevelt was also an uh, important part uh, of of the book because I um, I could describe the war uh, thanks to them. Um, and in the Second World War, I had other persons I used to uh, describe the time. Very good. Now, speaking of time, why don't we step back in time a little bit? And why don't you tell us about the time you first met Sherlock Holmes? I must have been 10 years old. Um, I don't remember it, <laughs> but I, I, I know I was 10 years old. I, I, I was into juvenile uh, crime fiction, and I read a lot of books. I practically lived at the library. Um, now that, that's hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, but um, yes, um, and um, I read Sherlock Holmes uh, detective stories, and uh, I found them. I must have found them fascinating in some way because I, I remember when I was thirteen, I um, had a teacher who he, he brought with him to the school. Um, uh, collected stories, uh, collected Sherlock Holmes stories, um, and uh, he, uh, I could, uh, oh, I could borrow them from him. Mm. So, um, and then <laughs> he, he later uh, during um, during class, uh, when we were in class, we, in front of all the other students, he started to discuss Sherlock Holmes with me. I was sitting there, and he started asking me questions about the stories I had read and so on. That's excellent. <laughs> he was a special teacher. Yeah. <laughs> really. but, um, but then, so I, I must have been interested in Sherlock Holmes. Um, I have, I have, I don't have that much memories of Sherlock Holmes otherwise from, from that time. But um, three years later when I was 16, that was when I really, 
got hooked uh, because that was the centenary uh, year, 1987. And uh, there were ex- exhibitions in Sweden and I got in touch with Shalakians all over the world and so on. Uh, I started corresponding with a lot of them. Um, and I started corresponding in, in Sweden with Ted Bergman, who oh. really became my friend and mentor. Sure. You you couldn't really have a better Sherlockian mentor in Sweden than Ted Bergman, right? No, no. Tell uh, tell our it, listeners it, who Ted was. It, he is uh, he is still alive. He is uh, or, it, it, okay. Yeah. I'm, I, uh, I was thinking no, he, he had left us. No, that's right. No, no. He will be ninety next year. So my goodness. Um, the thing is that. He, when I got in touch with him, he was working on a s- bibliography of uh, the Swedish editions uh, of Sherlock Holmes, and there are over three hundred. Hmm. Uh, all the all the uh, special uh, editions with different printing on on the spine and uh, so on, uh, and it also included all the newspaper articles and so on. And I started helping him. And he, he, he let me do that. So um, that way we, I think we had maybe 50, I, I got 50 letters from him each year, one, one, one letter every week. And so, and uh, I also started corresponding with, at least now and then with Peter Blau and not that much, but, 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 but a little and John Bennett Shaw now and then. And he was, of course, extremely generous towards me, which he was <laughs> towards so many. I had one friend, Don Hardenbrook, who sent me really nice things and really nice letters. So, so, and I wrote letters to a lot of the Sherlockian societies uh, all over the U.S. and in other countries and one, one funny thing is that um, I was uh, having correspondence with a, a group of really young uh, Sherlockians uh, um, they must have been teenagers or even even younger uh, and one of them uh, or the, there were two brothers uh, Chad and Zach Dundas I was just going to mention Zach <laughs> yeah. so he was one of, <laughs> one of them I corresponded with that's fun. I even wrote for their uh, for their newsletter. newsletter. That's wonderful. So uh, for folks who maybe haven't been with us as long, uh, Zach Dundas wrote uh, a book called The Great Detective uh, and was our guest on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere on episode 80. And mm-hmm. I remember at the time because his book came out right around the time of the Swedish version of your book. And, and you seemed, you seemed to be a little wary that you might be covering similar ground. And, and how did that end up working out for you? I think it ended up well because when I read his book, I realized that we have written about basically the same things, but from two so different perspectives. Oh. There were a few things in his books that I thought that, oh, I should have, use this in my book too if I had known it but uh, and now for the English edition I haven't <laughs> inserted those things anyway uh, because I wanted him to have have them but uh, I, I really liked his book uh, but it was so different from yeah. my own uh, because he, his book was so much much more personal Yeah, and there is also one thing about my book that um, since, since it's narrative nonfiction, I try never to be a voice myself. I never present theories of which version of these uh, events is actually true, and I never start academical discussions or introduce that kind of thoughts or ideas. I just present sort of what happened, uh, or at least one one version of what happened. Since I try to uh, always write from someone's perspective, mm-hmm. it could be Conan Doyle's perspective or Adrian Conan Doyle's perspective, and that makes it easier for me because I don't have to tell the truth all the time. Um, <laughs> I 
<laughs> no, and that's very good in a non-fiction book <laughs> that you yeah, don't have course, to tell the course. truth. Yeah, I could tell one version because this is what Adrian thought was going on. I can um, have him describe Heskett Pearson or someone like that, and the reader will understand yes. what is going on. Yeah. But I don't have to introduce all the facts. Right. Right. And, and, and that's it. I mean, he, he told, his was more of a memoir while yours was a story or a series of stories, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think and that, that works, uh, you know, if, if you've read The Great Detective, then get from Holmes to Sherlock. They are companion volumes. They are different sides of, uh, the same coin. And I have to call out a review. I hope you don't mind by, our fellow Baker Street Irregular, Michael Deirda, who writes for the book section of the Washington Post. And, and he gives us his background and he says, I, I mention all this simply to establish my bona fides and saying that Matthias Bostrom's From Holmes to Sherlock is the best account of Baker Street mania ever written. Really? That must have made yeah. a chill go up your spine when you read that. <laughs> I can't think of something more positive to say about the book than that. I mean, no, I don't know. Yes, I was rather happy when I read yeah, that. Yeah, rightly so. And, um, <laughs> you know, to, to Michael's point, you know, it does, it does get us in deep. And there are, there are those of us who have known some of these stories, certainly the more recent ones. Um, we, we've lived through them. We've witnessed them happen online and, and in person. It's, it's gratifying to see them all brought together, uh, under a single cover of a book. So I, I, I think it's valuable to, um, uh, to, to, to have that here from you. So when, when we think about particularly meeting with other Sherlockians, that's where so much of this, this interest, this hobby comes alive and where it, it's kept going for many years. And, and what's interesting to, to me is that your relation with other Sherlockians, for the most part, in, in the early part of your life, or your, of your Sherlockian life, that is, uh, was by correspondence. You, you probably had more Sherlockian pen pals than most people had at their uh, Sherlockian society meetings. Mm. Yes. And, I had enormous correspondence. Uh, I mean, I, I lived in the south of Sweden and there, there is a Sherlockian society in Sweden. Or well, there are several now, but um, I corresponded with them too because uh, I'm, there were six hundred kilometers between us. Oh dear! Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, which, which society was that? Was that the the Baskerville uh, Hall Club of Sweden? The Baskerville Hall Club. Okay. Yeah, and I went to some of their meetings, uh, but. Uh, I've always liked to correspond. I, I never like to have phone calls and, and, um, <laughs> and, yes. You're doing okay <laughs> like with we, this one. <laughs> yeah, this one is okay. <laughs> but, um, we'll explain why. Because I want it, uh, archived. Yeah. I, I want to have a memory of what was said. And this is, uh, this will be sort of archived. Yeah. Um, correspondence, I, I still have it archived. Every letter, I have received and almost all of them that I have sent also copies of them. So, yeah. um, nowadays I have, I mean, I don't have a good archive of all the emails I'm sending I, I know, or Facebook uh, <laughs> updates or Twitter messages, but, um, yeah, it's an archivist nightmare now. Yeah. But, uh, well, I hope all of those, uh, all of that correspondence, uh, eventually makes its way to the BSI Trust, you know, the archives of the BSI. Yes, at least the ones that are interested or connected to BSI. Yeah. I mean, the Swedish ones, uh, I mean, the letters in Swedish, I don't know if they should be there, but well, that's somewhere. A good point. That is a good point. So you mentioned uh, things in Swedish, and that reminded me, of the second volume of the BSI International series from the Baker Street Irregulars Press, which was Scandinavia and Sherlock Holmes. That was um, 
that was edited and translated by Bjorn Nielsen. And, um, yes, he has passed away and, yes, he and, is. and he's of course from, from Denmark, not Sweden, but that's where I was getting confused with Ted Bergman. So yes, uh, my apologies. And I- Yes, and I, I was, a, was sort of sub editor for the Swedish part of, I'll of bet. that book. Yeah, so so you've got um, you you've got a piece in here uh, about uh, Sherlock Holmes and Sweden, uh, so that's uh, uh, something as well. And um, and you've actually got another one uh, about the three plays uh, Sherlock Holmes in <laughs> Stockholm in 1902. Yeah, the William Gillette play, which was. On three different theaters in Stockholm at the same time, uh, you could on some some days in April 1902, you could actually choose between three different different versions of the same play. Wow! Uh, because uh, two of them were pirate versions. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, which is also a fun story how how they came to be pirate versions. A Danish sea captain, um, uh, Walter Christmas was his name. He, he tried to get the rights from Charles Froman for, uh, for, uh, for this, well, for Sweden, but he thought the rights were too expensive. So <laughs> he, he was uh, in New York at the time and he visited uh, the play that, that was in late 1899. And he wrote down, he visited the play in a number of evenings. He wrote down the important lines of the play on his, what's it called? Short cups? And his cups, Short cups. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he did his own version of the play, which is quite similar to yeah. Uh, yeah. Gillette's version, but, um, he introduces more action into it and there is okay. worse language ah, and so on. So. Okay. And you say he was a sea captain? Yes, he tried to sell. Uh, he had a very uh, interesting life, but he, I think he tried to sell some Danish islands in the West Indies to, to, he had failed say, uh, selling them to someone else, but to do whichever country it was. And now we tried to sell it to the United States. Wow. Wow. So he was a literal pirate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, well, he was doing it for the Danish government, mm. but uh, oh, okay. so we, <laughs> it wasn't a fake That's affair. Funny. That is funny. Well, um, that, that, Story is available in uh, Scandinavia and Sherlock Holmes, and that's still available uh, over on the BakerStreetJournal.com uh, website. So uh, feel free to hop over there and uh, and pick that copy up. Over on BakerStreetJournal.com, you'll find much more than just the acclaimed journal. It's also the home to the Baker Street Irregulars Press. The BSI Press has been actively publishing for more than 15 years and has a variety of titles to choose from. But the international series is probably one of the most interesting. You see, when local and regional Sherlockian groups publish material, it's usually only seen by those in their country or who speak their language. The BSI International Series takes material never seen before in the United States or in English and makes it accessible for all. Take Scandinavia and Sherlock Holmes, the second title. As we've been talking with Matthias Bostrom, this is the perfect volume to investigate. Scholarship from Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, translated into English. 30 pieces from some of the most prominent Holmesians in Europe. Will a Norwegian named Sigerson make an appearance? Well, you'll have to buy the book to see. Head over to BakerStreetJournal.com and pick up your copy today. You know, you, you've occasionally done some writing for us on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, and, and we've positioned ourselves for many years as the intersection of Sherlock Holmes and popular culture, uh, which, interestingly enough, is pretty much what your book is about. Um, 
you know, it, this, this constant wave of, um, um, you know, just popular culture and Sherlock Holmes in the, in the public's mind. Uh, mm-hmm. so delighted that, uh, we're, we're connected that way. And in one of your, and I have to say, every time you write for us, it's usually extraordinarily well received. You know, you, 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 you wrote a piece about, uh, rebuffing the supposed uh, lost Sherlock Holmes manuscript that was found in someone's attic in Scotland uh, mm. and, and refuted that uh, sensationalist uh, story that was out there in the media. One of the most high-trafficked stories on our site ever. So uh, we're grateful for that. But but one of the, the pieces that you wrote was about uh, something that you called the Parallel Homes. And you had referenced it as early as chapter 18 in your book. The parodies of the detective, you write, had created a parallel Sherlock Holmes. Can, can you talk about the parallel Holmes? Yes, because that's one of my main things. If I have one theory in the book, that, that is the one. Because I mean that there are two kinds of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, there, there is... The original Sherlock Holmes, that is Colin Doyle's stories, uh, the, the written stories, and not much more than that. Uh, and then there is the parallel Sherlock Holmes, which came when the, the first parodies were uh, written and some early pastiches, but there weren't many early pastiches, actually. But especially when the first plays... Uh, when William, William Gillette wrote his play and some other plays and, and, and this parallel Sherlock Holmes was slightly different from the ori- original one. I mean, in the parodies, he is, of course, different. He, he is uh, thinking even faster, uh, sometimes not being correct in, in his uh, deductions. And he, his manners and his uh, uh, special characteristics and so on are even, even weirder. And uh, um, what William Gillette then introduced, uh, we know of the deer stalker uh, and the curved pipe mm-hmm. and so on. And all these things were added, not to the original Sherlock Holmes, because that Sherlock Holmes lived on in a s- separate uh, way uh, when Conan Doyle uh, continued writing his stories, but they added to the parallel Sherlock Holmes. When you look at new versions of Sherlock Holmes, they don't have to be true true to the original Sherlock Holmes, but they can be true to the uh, the parallel Sherlock Holmes. And um, most non Sherlockians know more about and have seen more of this a parallel Sherlock Holmes than they have of the original um, because That's they cool. haven't seen what Conan Doyle wrote about the gentleman detective right. uh, which he is very seldom in in, in movies and, uh, and uh, uh, other stories when he, where yeah. he just is a little bit weirder. So you think about the, the history of the original Holmes, the parallel Holmes, um, the obviously the uh, ability of Conan Doyle's uh, stories to drive the subscribership of the Strand magazine, and obviously Gillette's prowess on the stage, being able to fill theaters, uh, and then we move into, of course, movies, television, internet. When you look across these various media, and you think about the the uh, the waves as, as it's it's had ebbs and flows uh, uh, over the years, and every generation has had its own Sherlock Holmes. Which one would you say has been the most influential in getting into the public's mind who Sherlock Holmes is? I mean, the most important is William Gillette because. What he did was um, making Sherlock Holmes really popular again. Or, or I mean, 
I've seen newspaper articles from the early 20th century, um, from 1902 or something, where where they say that more people have now seen Sherlock Holmes on stage than they have read Sherlock Holmes. Mm. I, I mean, I'm not sure if that was true, but that was was <laughs> written in the newspapers. That means that without William Gillette, Professor Moriarty wouldn't have been such uh, a well-known character because he, he, in the home stories, yes, he is in the final problem, but that is one short story. Mm -hmm. He has, I think it's 10 lines in it, but since uh, William Gillette used him for his play and made him such an important uh, part of it, everyone knew who Professor Moriarty was because the Gillette play was such a success in the US, the UK, all over Europe and in Scandinavia and so on. Yeah. I think Sherlock Holmes would have been a very different character, this parallel Sherlock Holmes, this movie Sherlock Holmes, without Professor Moriarty, because he, this superhero Sherlock Holmes mm. needed a supervillain. Yeah. Uh, and we can all, so many times that Moriarty has been introduced into f films, uh, pastiche films, uh, uh, not based on uh, the original, original stories. Professor Moriarty is so important. And that was thanks to Gillette. I, I don't think even if Conan Doyle would have written more uh, stories even without the Gillette play, uh, I don't think Moriarty would have been something everyone knew about. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point because Gillette did really make him such a central character in that in that drama, uh, and and you know Sherlock Holmes and Professor Moriarty has almost become. Uh, symbolic for uh, good and evil, uh, good guy, bad guy, you know, hero, uh, villain kind of thing, mm. um, and, and and to the point where it's it, it's it's almost universally uh, recognized without having to explain it. Yeah. Yes, and for popular culture, I mean, Moriarty is so important because he he is the model for. All of the the twentieth century's uh, uh, super villains. Yeah, yeah, he really is. So uh, I know there's uh, a, another project that you uh, are constantly working on, uh, along with another Sherlockian colleague over here in the states. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle, and the newspapers? Yes, Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the newspapers is a series of volumes covering newspaper articles from which we find Matt Laffin and I are collecting them and transcribing them and we find them in online archives from with old newspapers so we started in the 1880s and we try to find every mention of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in these old newspapers of course some mentions are not necessary to, to um, have in these books, but uh, we try to uh, include as much as possible, even if it uh, <laughs> even if it gets to be too much sometimes. But uh, this is really uh, something important for us to include as much as possible, yeah. because that way we can show how Conan Doyle was treated in the newspapers, uh, how Sherlock Holmes was, uh, went from an unknown character to um, become sort of an icon and used in other contexts mm. without mentioning Conan Doyle. The, Sherlock Holmes could be used in newspaper articles. Right. Oh, he was a real, a real uh, Sherlock Holmes who right. uh, sold that crime or something like right. that. Right. So, uh, Matt Laffey and I, we are uh, transcribing all these old newspaper articles and um, putting them in chronological order, and we we find a lot of interesting things 
if you read just some articles here and there, you don't see these things. But, for example, in the first volume, uh, there has been uh, three volumes until now. The first one was from 1881 to 1892, and the second one was from January to June 1893, <laughs> and the third one was from July to December 1893, and now we are working on 1894, and I'm not sure if it will be half a year or a the whole 1894. We hope it will be the whole 1894, so we can continue with uh, <laughs> this, more years. This, this sounds like a project that may keep you going for the next 40 years of your life. Yeah, we. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get my uh, my daughters to be Sherlockian so they can continue. Yeah, right. I'm dead. For example, when we uh, when we uh, put together the first volume, what we realized was that Conan Doyle didn't know that the book that made him famous in the U.S. was not a Sherlock Holmes book. Uh, he thought that. He, he wrote that in in his um, you know, Memories and Adventures, his autobiography. Uh, but he thought it was uh, pirate editions of A Study in Scarlet that made him famous. But it was Michael Clark, his historical novel. And you can see that because we have all, not all, but as a lot of the reviews from the, the American newspapers. It was a pirate edition, yes. You can see how his popularity was growing in uh, in the U.S., just thanks to Michael Clark. Mm. And that book, Conan Doyle, of course, he, he, he mentions it now and then uh, when he remembers uh, his old books. But he always, uh, Conan Doyle always thinks it's the White Company that was his real success uh, uh, regarding his historical novels, but Michael Clark was so important, and probably, had it not been for Michael Clark, I'm not sure that uh, Sherlock Holmes had become such a success in the United States, because uh, Michael Clark had made Conan Doyle uh, quite a famous author. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. Well, uh, just another reason to go and uh, pick up a copy of every single volume of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle in the newspapers from our friends at Wessex Press, who also happen to be a sponsor here. So that's a lovely dovetail. Yes, do that. I know, right? Well, this has been fascinating, Matthias, to understand the process uh, that you went through, to understand your mindset, to go on this journey with you of what it's like to tell a story, to create a work of nonfiction, uh, around, uh, you know, a, a lot of historical facts. It's, it's just been fascinating to hear how your mind works and, you know, how, how a Sherlockian that has so much information in your brain attic, uh, organizes it and, 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 and regurgitates it for the rest of us. Yes, it is a mainstream book. I, I meant it to be a mainstream book for mainstream readers, but it is for Sherlockians too. And, uh, well, maybe especially for Sherlockians. And what I think of it as my gift to Sherlockians, here you can read about things that you, a lot of the things in the book you already know about, but you have never seen it this way. You have never been able to live in in these events and in this uh, in these things yeah and and i think the the subtitle of the book you know that the, every, everyone sees from holmes to sherlock but the subtitle of the book is really what gets at the heart of what you're you're conveying and that is the story of the men and women who created an icon right that's what this is all about it's about the people behind mm-hmm the the icon uh, behind the, the the character and and you know oftentimes when we think about why it is we do what we do as Sherlockians if you want to get a little more non mainstream it's because of the people it, it's these interesting figures that we write to correspond with <laughs> talk to uh, online or in person that's what keeps us coming back this shared passion and and I have to tell you in in concluding. If I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the show, were a book, it would be From Holmes to Sherlock. 
Oh. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say so. Well, thank you for spending some time with us from all the way over in Sweden. And uh, we hope to see you around these parts again. Yes, I, I want to do that. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will come back. Yeah, what a great conversation. And what a fascinating book. You know, when I first started reading it, I was I didn't know quite what to make of it because as we discussed with Matthias, there's very there are hardly any models for anything like this, a narrative view. You know, oddly enough, it occurred to me after the fact that one of the models for it, of all things, is Winston Churchill's um Will, uh, Churchill's history of the English speaking peoples. Yeah. Because there he takes a narrative approach to history, really more storytelling. But I didn't realize that until much later. But how fascinating. Uh, yeah, all the way back to uh, to Caesar's time uh, and, and beyond. This is um, – that's a good point. You know, because history, when, when, you, when you approach any kind of historical work, it can be, it can be very dry. Uh, just dates and, and, and facts and places. And it's um, – I, I guess it, it's it's the the better storyteller among us that can take those those dry facts and weave them into some kind of narrative, weave them into some kind of story mm. that um, is more engaging and engrossing simply than uh, reading a litany of what happened and when. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know. I just opened, and it's odd. I didn't think of this before we spoke to Matthias. Yeah. In fact, I didn't think about it until just a few moments ago. But I just opened that same volume of Churchill to page 65, and you just look at any paragraph. On, at random, I just opened it. And Churchill says, of all the tribes of the Germanic race, none was more cruel than the Saxons. <laughs> Their very name, which spread to the whole confederacy of northern tribes, was supposed to be derived from the use of a weapon, the CX, a short one-handed sword. Although tradition and the venerable Bede assign the conquest of Britain to the Angles, Jutes, and Saxons together, and although, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he's just – now, who except Churchill would, would, you know, be able to have this sort of authorial voice narrating this kind of history? Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, you, you know, you think about the, the research that um, Matthias did to, to bring From Holmes to Sherlock to life and, and – you know the the uh, bibliography and the index prove it. Uh, but think about what uh, the, the scale and scope that Churchill had to do uh, to accomplish the very same thing. Yeah. What what's you know we asked Matthias what surprised him in his research. What surprised you when you read Matthias's book? You know I think as as one who has uh, traipsed this subject before. It didn't surprise me as a Sherlockian. I guess it surprised me as it appeared so deeply in a book that is aimed at a wider public, and that is the Conan Doyle boys and and oh. how prominent their storyline was in this whole thing. Oh, isn't that funny? You know, I was prepared to tell you what surprised me, and it's exactly the same thing. I had, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we've read over the years and learned about Dennis and Adrian and all of this. But I had no sense of them as sort of wastrel children who grew up in an era of bright young things. And I had no sense of their incredible stupidity. You know, when you look <laughs> at, at the whole, what Matthias reports in terms of Adrian's involvement in various projects, the uh, sort of magical thinking, lousy execution, uh, goofy suppositions, associating with weird characters, things turning into nothing – it's it's a it's a um, a panoply of folly. It is. Uh, it, it's almost as if uh, you know Conan Doyle, uh, who seemingly everything he touched uh, was successful, almost <laughs> passed along a reverse Midas touch to his children. Well, and the goofier thing too was, you know, you could. And this is one of the things that I've argued with biographers over the years. You know, if you put Sir Arthur in his time, it's uh, not so much of a reach to attribute his enthusiasm and belief in spiritualism in the context of the time. But here are his children who apparently 
uh, up through the 1950s or so. And there's one anecdote somewhere in Matthias's book where Dennis or Adrian, I think it was probably Dennis, is talking to Basil Rathbone. And Basil Rathbone says, apparently, in all seriousness, to one of these boys, you know, I, I should really like to speak to your father at one point. And, and, and they respond, uh, well, you know, that would take about six months of living in the house, and you really have to do this and do that before, you know, you could possibly. Oh, I was just astonished to read that. Incredible. I mean, Sir Arthur has never responded to any of my notes. He's never responded to any of my messages. Well, he, uh, I thought he had responded to the Sherlock Holmes brand Ouija board at one point, <laughs> hadn't he? Was that one of our old spots? Yeah. Uh, it should have been, but you know, he bought, he bought a couple of those, but his check bounced, so. <laughs> Friends, the seasons are changing. Soon the kitties will be trick or treating, all dressed up like Elsa or Olaf. How can your children pick the lively and literary way to celebrate Halloween? That's why you need the new line of costumes from Sherlock Holmes brand Halloween products. Choose from the simple red-headed wig of Jabez Wilson, the tiny loincloth of Tonga, the Andaman Islander, the harpoon through the chest costume of Black Peter Carey, the gaunt and destitute Hugh Boone, the leaping monkey gland enriched Professor Presbury, and so much more. They're the only Halloween costumes that deliver the three C's, captivating canonical characters. characters. And if you have the space, choose the inflatable Mycroft Holmes. <laughs> Available at your local Sherlock Holmes brand retailer today. You know, we, we really do need to get together a, uh, a complete collection of all the Sherlock Holmes brand spots and, uh, <laughs> and run that at some point. Yes, I told James O'Leary a long while ago that I wanted to put together a catalog. Maybe I'll still do that. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Man, maybe in time for the holidays. <laughs> See, there you go. Well, friends, if you haven't gotten a copy of From Holmes to Sherlock yet, um, rush right out or stay right in and order from Amazon. Get yourself a copy. It is uh, a, a fascinating and comprehensive read to this little hobby, which we call uh, Sherlockianism. Uh, it is, it is well worth it. And for, for those of you who perhaps have friends or family members that, um, want a better understanding as to why this has happened, uh, how it has happened over the years, um, uh, pick them up a copy or get your own and lend them yours. Uh, but it is something to think about as you move into the holiday season as well. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, you can also think about, whether or not we move into the holiday season, is how you might support us here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Uh, certainly, PayPal is an option, uh, as is Patreon. Uh, either one gives you the opportunity to have a way to support the show on a recurring basis, to show your appreciation for what it is that we do, and to help us pay for all of the sundry things that cost money to help grease the skids here from email to audio hosting uh, fees to web hosting fees, uh, you name it. Uh, that would be of great assistance. Very much so. And what Bert is trying to say there is that you should also reach out and get in touch with us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for goodness sakes, you can find us on every social media platform Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, every place at I Hear of Sherlock. And you could call us. Call us on the telephone. Leave us a message. It's 221-7-something-something. 7323. Something. That's right. 221-READ. 734-221-READ. And 221-734-READ. Yes. That's what you can do. And call as, us, please. As the summer is dwindling down, you know, before people leave the beach – why don't you scrawl us a note in the sand and then send a drone up over the beach and photograph it and then send us that photograph with that message to IHOS. Mm -hmm. Right? That would work. Yeah, print out that picture and make sure it's a sharp and crisp 8x10 and put that in a stiff folder and mail that off with extra postage to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to Grimsby Royal. Um Right down Upper, there in Stoke Moran. Where where was yes. where was that? Surrey. 
Yes. So. Mail it off to Grimsby Royal and Stoke Moran, postage paid, and see what good it'll do you. Yes. That's another feather in his cap. Yes. It's very sad when you send things to Grimsby Royal. He has a habit of bending them in half and sending them back to you. Or at least throwing it over the parapet. <laughs> no, no. That's, that's only the blacksmith. <laughs> well, lest you run into any ruffians alongside the road or over a parapet, remember to tell them, I ho sent you, and until then, I remain Scott Monty. Until then, I'm remaindered as Bert Wolder. <laughs> the, the game's, game's afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.